Welcome to our ongoing series of lectures on spans and proportions of common spanning systems. We are in chapter one. Section seven, and we've added a point two corresponding to steel, and this is the third in our lecture series on the spans and proportions of common steel systems. And in this case, we're dealing with steel rigid, rigid frames. I'm gonna learn to control this mouse eventually. So a rigid frame looks something like this. It's kind of reminiscent of an arch, but it doesn't have quite the right shape for an arch as a consequence. It's tending to bulge outward here and bulge outward there and move downward here. And the most severe internal effects or moments are occurring at these corners and it diminishes when we go up. So basically we give the structure the maximum thickness right here, which is the most critical point. So there are two important things that we describe in terms of uh, such a rigid frame. One is the so-called rise. R is the rise of the frame. And typically this is between L over 6 and L over 2 for this particular kind of frame. Now this rule right here doesn't have to apply. You can have things that are much deeper and we sometimes do that for particularly significant spaces where we want real loft to them and typically that would be a religious space like a church, um, in which case R could go all the way up to being equal to L. But uh, among the common uh, systems that we use, it would be pretty rare for R to exceed L over 2, and it would certainly not be driven by structural logic because at that point we'd be creating a structure that's too tall and uh, has too much wind burden on it. Um, but we would pay the price for that if we wanted a particularly lofty space. So rise is the first thing. We're basically going from uh, R equals L over 6 to R equals L over 2. So in other words, this span, um, and I guess I need to go back and find that. Um, <clears throat> this span right here is up to about 200 feet. Um, so in other words, 200 over 6, which would be the situation we're dealing with right here, would be about uh, 33 feet high, um, and L over 2 would be more like 100 feet high. So that would be the range for the rise of one of these steel rigid frames. The other crucial dimension that's given here is the depth of this cantilever at the root of the cantilever, which is typically uh, equal to uh, the length of the cantilever, which we see up here, which is from there to, from the center point down to the root. Um, that length of the cantilever divided by 14 would be the shallowest it would be, and then divided by 10 would typically be about the deepest that it would be. Um, and the other crucial thing, of course, is this cantilever right here cannot work off of, cannot cantilever off of this vertical element if the vertical element is weak. So typically that dimension and that dimension are always understood to be the same. Or if they're not, it means one of them is oversized and the other one is the right size. And the reason for oversizing might depend upon some architectural situation. But typically, almost always when you see a frame like this, this dimension will be equal to that dimension. Okay, so this shows an example of something like this where we have a really thick joint right here. We have a minimal joint there and a minimal joint here. And um, one of the key things I'll point out to you is that we have uh, tremendous compressive forces in this bottom flange here. And that bottom flange wants to buckle to one side or the other. And so in this case, that uh, frame, the interior portion of that frame that's in compression, is being braced with a series of struts that go out and grab hold of the purlins. So these are the purlins or the beams. And those beams, from a gravity point of view, are being supported by this rigid frame, 
and then they're kind of paying the favor back by going in and bracing the bottom cord of the rigid frame. So it's kind of a classic symbiotic relationship uh, where the two things are helping each other out. And every step along the way here, the bottom flange of this rigid frame, the bottom flange that's in compression, is being braced by these purlins. So we have a purlin across here and bracing that goes down to that bottom cord. Uh, you can find ways to make the frame inherently more stable, like you can make its bottom flange much wider, or you can make it a tubular structure, uh, all of which is possible, but typically the cheapest and simplest way that we do it is to just put these bracing elements in. Some people feel that they're visually messy and don't want that, and certainly you can design a tubular frame as a way of getting around that problem. Okay, so here's another example. It's just showing uh, the nature of this joint right here. The interesting thing is, for portability reasons, we typically make the field connection at this joint. So we have this interesting problem that we want that joint to be the strongest part, but that's also where we make the field connection. And as a consequence, we actually typically make this joint bigger than it needs to be because we want to provide some efficiency for that uh, field connection so it's not terribly expensive. So if we come and zoom in on that, we discover that this portion of that frame has been prefabricated and brought to the site, and this portion has been prefabricated, and they're bolted here. You see there are three bolts on each side that go through here, which take care of a tendency to separate here due to wind suction, and then under normal gravity load, this is where the tension exists between the two and there are four bolts on each side at that location. So all the stresses in these flanges come up and then they have to get rerouted through the web and through this plate and then into that plate and then back into the web and then ultimately back into that flange member. So it's a rather circuitous path. It would be great of course from a structural efficiency point of view to weld the two flanges together there and weld them together on the other side. But we don't typically do that because we, we know a building like this might have a finite lifetime and we want to be able to disassemble it and move it somewhere else. So the basic point is that there's a lot of stuff in the vicinity here which is over designed, including this dimension across here. It's over designed compared to what it needs to be if we didn't have this as a field splice um, for, for constructability. But all our guidelines take into account that. So when we give a depth of the cantilever or a, a, or a dimension for this element across here, which is basically the same as that dimension across there, all that has accounted for the fact that we're trying to do this very convenient field connection. Okay, so that's a, for fairly tall uh, versions of this. Let me just go back for a second. If, if this height is fairly substantial, right here, if the rise compared to the span is fairly substantial, we'll typically use this thing where we have a simple tapered element there and a simple tapered element here, and it's a pretty simple frame. For some shallow elements like this, For some shallow structures, where we're down in the range of a rise of L over 6 down to L over 5, there's very little surface for wind, for wind on the structure to impact it significantly. So we're really um, mainly designing for gravity loads. And under those circumstances, the structure tends to deform like this. The side parts do that and the top part sort of has a curvature like that, then it gets a curvature like that, and then a curvature like that. In other words, there's tension on the outside here, compression on the inside, there's compression on the top, and tension on the bottom, and then tension on the outside, and compression on the bottom, and there's a, a sort of zone that you go through here where there's no tension and compression because you're transitioning from tension here to compression, to tension, or in this case from compression to tension to compression.
So we give it this kind of a geometry where we cantilever off about 20% of the way and we do that on both sides and then we have a structure in the center that's basically like a simple span. Um, and they're, they're still under wind load and other things can be some moment at these locations. So those aren't, aren't pin joints because if you have four pin joints, like if you have a pin joint down at the bottom of the base and then, so you have pin joints there and there and there and there, the structure will collapse over even under a slight breeze. But in general, the thickness of this is responding to influences from the gravity load where we basically have fairly severe uh, compression and tension there and there and there. So the structure goes thin, thick, thin, thick, thin, thick, thin. And this is what that looks like in an actual physical manifestation. So you'll notice there's really good thickness there, really good thickness here, but less so there and there and at the base on each of these supports. So again, we are specifying the rise, in this case fairly shallow, L over six, to the deepest, which is L over five. So if this is spanning 300 feet and we're L over five, we have a 60 foot rise. If we're L over six, um, we have a 50 foot rise. So this, this is over a fairly narrow range of R values. And again, we have um, the thickness at the base here um, as a, so here is, for example, is the length of the cantilever and the depth at the base of the cantilever should be in this zone right here. And the depth of the center span should be that where LSS is the span of the simple span, which is from there to there. And again, the cantilevers are roughly 20% and the simple span is 60% to uh, 20 plus 20 plus 60 is 100% of the full span. So the next kind of structural system is to go back to a simple taper here and a simple taper there for a fairly tall structure. So you'll notice we're replicating in the case of this geometry we're replicating what we saw before for the solid web, which looks something like this. The difference is the solid web has a depth at the root of L sub C over 14 to L sub C over 10, whereas here it's L sub C over 12 to L sub C over 9. In other words, this depth is typically deeper, and that's classic when you go from solid web to um, trust web that the uh, webbing elements in the truss are more stable relative to lateral buckling and as a consequence the truss-like structure is always deeper. That's the logical response. So instead of L over 10 here, which we saw for solid webs, we see L over 9. And instead of L over 14, we see L over 12 for that cantilever. And again, you'll notice the depth of this portion when it comes to the joint is equal to the depth of that portion because this cantilever right here is cantilevering off of this vertical element. It doesn't make any sense to have a really deep cantilever cantilevering off of some flimsy element. So we have an example of this, and by the way, this also we have a parallel between this and the geometry we saw before for solid webs where we would go to a shallow structure in this case, L over 6 to L over 5 for the rise, uh, where L, by the way, is the overall span here. So that's L. We have the same shape that we had for the solid web. But we're going to go look at an example right now of this particular thing where the depth at the root should be L over 9 to L over 12. And this is what it looks like. Unfortunately, there's all this junk built in here, so you can't see the entire frame but you do get this sense of something that's not too deep right there, but that becomes very deep at the root where it's cantilevering outward. And in this case, this truss, by the way, was made out of uh, wide flange sections. In this case, sometimes these wide flange sections are just welded where the members meet there, and that's a very good way to do it. This is a somewhat older structure. They used these plates, which we call gusset plates, 
and in this case I think they've used rivets although these yes they've used rivets so this is certainly not something that's been done in really recent years because riveting technology is just not our standard anymore but what's cool about this structure is the compression in the bottom cord is going to be better resisted because the flanges have been set with the webs horizontal so that basically they're much more stable laterally and resisting lateral loads. The other thing that's kind of interesting here is because these things are so deep, instead of just bracing them up to the purlins, these elements have been added to allow two adjacent trusses to stabilize each other and then they've left out the trusses in between which is kind of cool uh, visually I think it's very appealing um, that ends our discussion of spans and proportions of steel rigid frames